Thank you for coming. And, and what Aidan did forget to mention is that any photographer who has ever worked with me will tell you I am always a technical nightmare. But um, it's a pleasure to be back at Exposure. Um, tonight, I'm going to talk about uh, evolution in storytelling at the National Geographic. And over the last 10 years, uh, what we have done is evolved from telling wildlife stories with a focus on behavior towards features that shine a light on issues on wildlife conservation and animal welfare. Beautiful wildlife images make people care about nature, but the stories that need to be told and the photographs that must be seen are the ones that shine a light on our relationship with the natural world. Photography becomes evidence, highlighting our treatment of animals in the tourism trade, how pangolins are the most endangered mammal you've never heard of, and how traditional medical beliefs had threatened wildlife around the world. Now, the shift in focus really became clear to me a few years ago when I was asked to curate an exhibit on the 50 best wildlife photographs from the National Geographic collection. So let's take a look at that. It was great fun to do that exhibit, but almost immediately I realized the show that I wanted to do and hoped to do someday was one that focused on conservation. And while these images that I just shared are fantastic, um, I worked on many of these stories and I'm proud of those photos. And this week you'll be hearing from several of the contributors, Amy Vitale, Steve Winter, Franz Lanting, and Stephen Wilkes. But 10 years ago, starting with Brent Sturton's story, Who Murdered the Mountain Gorillas? And even that headline generated controversy with our readers who argued with us that you can't murder an animal. And on to Brian Scarry and Randy Olson's Global Fisheries Package. And this is bycatch, the cost of a shrimp dinner being tossed overboard and Paul Nicklin's article on narwhal hunting, things began to change rapidly at National Geographic. And not only did these stories challenge our internal approach to natural history stories, more importantly, they inspired the approach that our photographers took to these coverages. We actively went from doing natural history to doing conservation storytelling. And what does that really mean? And I'm going to quote from the website Eyes on Earth. Environmental photography documents our planetary perils and highlights solutions. It recognizes that we cannot save or protect what we cannot see. And it seeks to reveal what other photography may neglect. For National Geographic, that meant that we had to start 
sharing with our audience the conservation challenges that were happening wherever we looked. Gorillas, fisheries, narwhals, that those stories evolved very naturally in the course of putting them together. But the truly conscious change started with a story on the Serengeti lions. When Nick Nichols and I proposed a story on these lions, part of our coverage plan read, Nichols and writer David Quammen will also take an unflinching look at the challenges lions face in a modern world. They will examine habitat loss, trophy hunting, poisoning, and all the factors that have taken an enormous toll on lion populations, as well as the human cost of living with predators. After those other stories, there was simply no way that we could do a purely natural history story on lions. This is Sea Boy. Writer David Qualman said that he and Nick chose to focus on Sea Boy because he was everything an African lion should be. Resourceful, cantankerous, patient, proud but pragmatic, seemingly indestructible, continually imperiled, and gorgeous to behold. The challenge, Nick became so immersed in photographing the lions that the coverage mandate simply disappeared. He was seduced by the natural history, the very thing we were trying to avoid. He got to know the lions as individuals. He was learning pride dynamics. He simply could not tear himself away from covering the pure natural history, the very thing that we were trying to change. He absolutely went rogue. This is the Vumbi pride and the capturing a warthog at the height of the dry. And then this is the tension when the coalition of males known as the killers came into the Vumbi pride's territory. Seaboy had tangled with them once before and had barely survived the encounter. He went missing for two days after these lions appeared, and everyone held their breath assuming that he was dead until he turned up very much alive in full mating swing. When Seaboy died five years after the story, we actually ran an obituary for him, and it read, Deceased, adult male lion, roughly 14 years old, with a dark mane, known to researchers and to the readers of National Geographic as Seaboy. Dead of natural causes, his body discovered by a tour driver in the backcountry of Serengeti National Park on a day in early June 2018. His demise mourned by those who knew him and read about him. His longevity and force of character a marvel to behold. But no matter how we perceive lions in the abstract, living with them and what is happening to them are very different propositions, and one that in spite of Nick's seduction, we had to cover. Enter Brent Sturton. When Nick refused to leave the lions, we assigned Brent to take on the seemingly impossible task of dealing with the issues surrounding human-wildlife interaction. Lions are responsible, on average, for 250 deaths per year, and to have ignored that would have been grossly irresponsible. Or as Kwaman puts it, lions are complicated creatures, magnificent at a distance, yet fearsomely inconvenient to the rural peoples whose fate it is to live among them. This is Yasufo. He had been fishing in the Salu when he was attacked by a lion, his arms were shredded beyond repair when he tried to fight him off, and they had to be amputated. And David Chancellor just touched a little bit on some of the issues facing lions in South Africa. Uh, one of them is um, captive bred lions. South Africa is the only country in the world that has three classes of lions, wild, managed, or captive. In South Africa, thousands of lions are captive bred then released for hunting within confined areas, guaranteeing the hunter makes a kill. However, without a market for trophy hunting these days, there is little incentive to keep these cats alive. And the captive hunting. 
Owners of private breeding farms say that hunting of captive bred lions takes pressure off declining wild populations. But according to Dr. Luke Hunter, the former president of Panthera, that is simply not true. In an interview with National Geographic, Hunter said, this industry pumps out cats to be shot in cages or shipped to Asia to supply the demand for big cat parts. And here are those big cat parts. This is wildlife trade. Lion bones are legally exported to Asia for supplementing trade in traditional medicines due to the decline in wild tiger populations. In addition to the challenges of living with wildlife, Brent also managed to capture some of the cultural aspects of the relationship. And here some Zakuma lion killers are claiming tribute after killing lions in defense of a village. And hope. These are Maasai warriors now working as lion guardians. They monitor prides and prevent conflict between herders and cattle. So together, the wildlife and conservation photographs made for one of the most powerful conservation stories that we've ever produced. But this is mostly due to the narrative created by Brent's photographs. To have ignored the human-wildlife conflict issues and the tremendous challenges faced by the communities living with lions would have meant that we'd missed half the story. So this year we published a story on pangolins. And they've been described as scaly anteaters, little dinosaurs, or something out of the Pokemon universe. But aside from their overwhelming cute factor, pangolins are perhaps the world's most trafficked, least known, and most endangered mammal. And why? the erroneous belief that their scales have medicinal value. So the goal of this project was to introduce pangolins to our readers and to shine a light on what is happening to them. What does it mean to be the world's most trafficked mammal? There are eight species of pangolin, four in Africa and four in Asia. The Asian pangolins have been hunted to near extinction due to demand for the scales, which are considered both a delicacy and thought to have medicinal purposes. Poachers have now turned their attention to the African species to fill the void. At least 67 countries and territories on six continents have been involved in the pangolin trade. But the shipments with the biggest quantities of scales have originated in Cameroon, Nigeria, Sierra Leone, and Uganda, and they're mainly heading to China. This photograph by Paul Hilton is horrifying to look at, but talk about evidence. This underscores the scale of trade in these animals. You are looking at 4,000 yep. You are looking at 4,000 carcasses found along with scales and nearly 100 animals that were still alive. This was one of the largest seizures of pangolins on record. And while the bus was made in Indonesia, the cargo was most likely headed to China or Vietnam. Now, the IUCN estimates that more than one million pangolins trafficked in the last decade. Brent was able to spend time with rangers working with the Avorian unit for transnational crime. They captured an Avorian trafficker and his three accomplices, as well as a Vietnamese trafficker who was caught with not only pangolins, but forest elephant tusks. What you see here represents roughly 11,000 pangolins. 11,000 animals were killed, and that trafficker received only one year in jail. He's out now. At the Tiki Haywood Foundation Rehabilitation Center in Zimbabwe, rescue pangolins are assigned caregivers who teach them how to be wild, helping them find ants and termites to eat, and keeping them safe from both predators and poachers. Hey Wood is one of the very few people in the world who has been able to keep pangolins alive in captivity. And there is simply no way to breed these animals in captivity to meet demand. So what makes them so vulnerable? When in danger, pangolins roll into a ball. And against a lion, their little armored bodies offer full protection. Against a human, there couldn't be a worse defense. All a poacher has to do is scoop them up. 
Now, pangolins have always faced threat from the bushmeat trade. And while in Cameroon, Brent came across this young woman. She bought this juvenile pangolin from a middleman for $15. He bought it from bushmeat hunters. She took it home and slaughtered it. She says she has been selling scales for about a year, but has been selling pangolin meat for at least 10. And she told Brent that they're becoming harder and harder to find and more and more expensive. At the time this photograph was made, eating pangolin was still legal, but trade was recently outlawed. It's the growing threat from the Asian market that prompted CITES to ban the commercial trade in all pangolins, including the African species, just last year. Brent encountered Bar, a hunter from the central village region of Borneo, when he brought a pangolin to the city to sell to a middleman. The pangolin will either be consumed in the nearby city of Surabaya and its scales used for traditional medicine, or it will be trafficked into Vietnam, Laos, or China, where it will sell for far more. Bar says he brings in pangolins at twice a week. This was an illegal activity, but it was not difficult to find. And then Brett met Duo, 71, a sixth generation traditional medicine doctor, seen with his wife in their home, where they're grinding scales and mixing them with herbs to create a medicine he uses to treat tumors. Doe says that he has never been sure about the efficacy of pangolin scales, but his customers trust in it. And he says this is a testament to the power of belief. But let's be very clear. What he is grinding is keratin, and it's no different than chewing your nails, and it has no scientifically proven medicinal power. And a rumor that the scales contain tramadol, an opiate, was also recently disproved. But again, hope. We always look for hope. Here, members of Vietnam's first anti-poaching team and the NGO Saving Vietnam's Wildlife walk upriver and release 25 rescued pangolins into a remote national park. They first feed them ant eggs and make sure they're hydrated. Then they gently carry the pangolins into a secure zone and release them back into the wild. Evidence doesn't always provide proof of crime or decline, and sometimes we can highlight good news. In the case of Mozambique's Gorongosa National Park, the visual proof underscores one of Africa's greatest wildlife restoration projects. Established as a national park in the 60s, Gorongosa was a safari destination, referred to as the place where Noah left his ark. There were 2,200 elephants, hundreds of lions, 14,000 buffalo, as well as hippos, impalas, zebras, and wildebeest roaming the park. But the 15 years of civil war that followed independence left the park in tatters. And by the time the war ended, most of the wildlife had been slaughtered for food while ivory was used to buy weapons. Of the 14,000 buffalo, fewer than 50 remained. Of the 3,000 zebra, there were just nine. Enter American philanthropist Greg Carr. Greg made his fortune developing voicemail technology. And after two decades in business, he was looking for an opportunity to fund conservation and development work. Now, through a partnership with the government of Mozambique, Carr has pledged $40 million over the next 20 years to help revitalize the park. Wild dogs were eradicated during the Civil War, but during the course of our coverage, a pack was released. We were told not to expect to see them, but Charlie had multiple encounters with them. There was nothing shy about these animals. They owned that savanna, and they will be critical in reestablishing the overall health of this ecosystem. And they are doing so well that two litters of pups have already been born. Over 150 species of birds can be spotted in Gorongosa in a single day. Here, whistling ducks, pelicans, and storks forage in Lake Urima. But Carr is doing more than just rewilding an ecosystem. He views Gorongosa as a human rights issue, believing that parks have to go beyond wildlife conservation 
they must benefit surrounding communities. This means generating tangible benefits for locals from health care, education, and economic development that is in harmony with protecting the biological diversity. What good is restoring the wildlife if the communities don't share in the process? Here, locals are now participating in a coffee growing scheme and working to reforest the mountain to protect the watershed. Perhaps most importantly, Carr believes that if you don't empower, educate, and employ the women and girls in the communities around the park, everything will be for nothing. If populations around the park continue to grow due to early marriage of girls and large families, nothing that happens within the park boundaries can protect the landscape and wildlife. He says if girls are in school and women have opportunities, then they will adhere to a two-child approach to family development. And this is where human development and conservation merge. Rights for women lead to poverty alleviation, and it is what will save these parks. Here we see young girls participating in Girls Club, a program meant to focus on literacy, health, and play. And the park also employs women as rangers. Back to this wildlife spectacle, though. Zebra reintroductions have been happening in the park since 2013, and the latest aerial count of wildlife in the park shows that populations of large mammals are continuing to rebound. And the Gorongoso Biodiversity Program is a new park initiative that aims to teach the next generation of Mozambique University students biologists and conservationist leaders with the goal of having them take charge of conservation in their own country. And that transition from foreign-led efforts to homegrown expertise is key. And to that end, this is Dominique Calclavis. She's a Mozambican ecologist in charge of the Parks Elephant Program. And she says, I am part of the next generation that have to make sure that this place survives. So Mozambicans protecting Gorongosa and benefiting from conservation. And that is what a human rights park means. Every year, I share some of Joel Sartori's photo arc with exposure. And I'm not going to disappoint you today. Photo arc is now in its 15th year. And Joel Sartori is close to photographing 10,000 species. The magazine and society's latest collaboration with Joel honors a species that most urgently need our attention, the animals that are now on the IUCN red list. Ranging from least concerned to extinct in the wild, whether a South China tiger or a yellow-footed tortoise, all listed species deserve our concern. As always with PhotoArc, the goal is to shine a light on all species, from the most attractive to the least and to show the irreversible face of extinction. This is a Bachman's warbler, 
and the last time one was seen in the wild was 1988. The caption here reads, precisely because extinction takes place so frequently now, it's possible to become inured to it. And it is this desensitizing that makes our Tories work so crucial. This catalog of species is the value of the photo arc. Disease and loss of habitat have had devastating impacts on amphibian populations. Romeo, a Sakaikis water frog, the big guy on the bottom, was thought to be the last of his species. But in a rare bit of good news, just last year in Bolivia, scientists found five more of the frogs, including three potential mates for Romeo. In the article, writer Betsy Colbert says that the last mass extinction was due to an asteroid impact. This time around, it will be death by a thousand cuts. In the case of the New Guinea endemic kagu, a flightless bird known as the ghost of the forest, invasive species like cats, dogs, pigs, and rats have had a debilitating impact. And the lovely Muir gazelle numbers, fewer than 300, its habitat now fragmented due to livestock. And so little is known about most butterfly species that they are recognized as imperiled even though most of them have not yet been listed. Over the past three generations, populations of Asian elephants have decreased by at least 50%. And it was recently reported that in addition to poaching for their ivory, there is now even a market for jewelry made of the elephant's subcutaneous fat in their skin. And what are the challenges facing lemurs? Well, this sifaka may only be fertile one day out of the year, while an ayai is considered bad luck and often killed on sight. The brown lemur is hunted for bushmeat and the pet trade. But the unifying threat for lemurs is deforestation. There is no life without the forest. Joel says, if we're lucky, we find rare sparks that can bring species back from the brink. Some, like the Pear David's deer, survive in captivity and with good fortune and hard work are reintroduced to the wild. Others, like the Columbia River Basin pygmy rabbit, persist in a new form, hybrids, but still here. But the grave truth is that for most animals, extinction is forever. And that stark truth makes it all the more clear that we must save what we have. Throughout my career, I've had the honor of working on a few stories that have had a real impact upon publication, from the creation of the Gabonese National Park System, to changing shipping regulations to protect right whales, to banning migratory songbird hunting. They are few and far between, but they are gratifying in immeasurable ways. So I was completely unprepared for the trajectory of our story on wildlife tourism. From beginning to end, this story has changed a few policies, it's generated action, and it impacted one life in particular. This story started as a Wildlife Watch report on our digital platform. It took a look at the uptick in tourism in the Amazon and the impact on local wildlife. The team traveled along the river, reporting on tour operators working with small villages to supply a steady stream of animals for tourism encounters. Snakes, caimans, birds, anteaters, and sloths, all in support of selfies. Upon publication, the impact was immediate. Instagram announced that they would start to deliver a pop-up message whenever someone searched on or clicked hashtags like sloth selfie. The message reads in part, you are searching for a hashtag that may be associated with posts that encourage harmful behavior to animals or the environment. These are actually the same tools built to tackle self-harm and suicide, now being used to alert users that this behavior can harm wildlife. We thought that was the end of it. 
but it turned out that this story was the tip of the iceberg. So let's start with a video made by the writer Natasha Daly. Eight, nine, ten. <laughs> oh, these little pirates. <sighs> Jesus. We came behind the stadium where the elephants perform, and we found this juvenile elephant. Um, he has a gaping red wound at his temple. He also has a broken leg. The other one is chained up. He looks totally emaciated, his skin and bones. And this is the worst shape I've seen an elephant in in Thailand. All in the name of entertainment. Wildlife tourism is a massive industry, accounting for 10 to 20% of the global tourism industry. People go on vacation and pay money to either view or interact with animals. I don't think we can ignore the role that social media plays. The sheer number of people now not only posting their travel experiences, but consuming others' travel experiences means that these things are spread in an instant with the click of a button. But the issue with wildlife tourism is most people have absolutely no idea of what goes on behind the scenes. Most tourists, I really do believe, kind of want to do the right thing. They love animals and they want to get close to them. It's simple, um, it's understandable. And since 2014, the number of, of animal selfies that people have posted has grown almost 300%. Part of what often inspires people to go on this trip is because they saw someone else do it and they want that experience for themselves. However, social media really does go both ways. I wanted to actually visit a couple of good elephant experiences in Thailand, uh, just to see for myself what that looked like and how it differed from places that may call themselves a sanctuary but offer a lot of interaction. So we went to Elephant Valley in Chiang Rai, Thailand. They have elephants that have been rescued from the traditional industry and tourists are not allowed to get close to the elephants. This is probably the only interaction that tourists will get while they're here. Um, it's snack time, so they're able to feed um, each of the elephants some bananas. And you can see this barrier is there mostly for, um, to prevent people from going into the, the, elephant, uh, the elephant grounds. So it's totally voluntary. The elephants come um, for snack time and then they can leave whenever they want. Um, so it's a sustainable option for elephant tourism in the area. Social media can actually be harnessed for good. You can go to a, an ethical place and use social media to sort of educate your own communities on ways that they can be part of the solution. As Natasha discovered, underpinning many wildlife tourism activities around the world is extreme animal suffering. And social media is driving the demand for riding elephants, swimming with dolphins, posing with tigers. Influencers, people with huge Instagram followings who post photos from exotic locations, are fueling these activities. But most travelers don't know that their interactions with animals almost always involve animal abuse. The team felt that they couldn't stop with the Amazon story. We wanted to go behind the scenes of harmful wildlife tourism in Thailand, Russia, and the United States. You look at this picture, trust me, without declawing chains or drugs, no one could safely pose with these tigers. And these are two glimpses behind the scenes at wildlife entertainment centers, one at a uh, circus in St. Petersburg, and the elephant from the video, Gly Hum, at the Crocodile Farm and Zoo near Bangkok. Bear cubs are often kept in standing positions, tethered to the wall by their necks to make them strong enough to walk on their legs for entertainment. 
and you now know how Natasha found Goli home. Few visitors to either venue would ever witness this suffering. And when Natasha asked the zoo's owner for an explanation about Gly Hum, he simply threatened to sue us. Along the Amazon and in the United States, there are countless swim with dolphin programs. And here, an Amazon River dolphin jostles for fish, not affection, while surrounded by tourists. These are 400 pound wild animals and the potential for injury to them and to the tourist, not to mention disease transfer, is one miscue away. At least these dolphins are wild. In the United States, the swim with programs are wildly popular and lucrative. But if you consider that these are animals that live in complex social groups, can swim 40 miles a day and dive hundreds of feet, do they really belong in pens so that we can experience a dolphin hug and a photograph? Macaques at the monkey school near Chiang Mai, Thailand, ride tricycles, play basketball, and twirl parasols. And they are kept in three by three foot metal cages whenever they are not performing. In a photo studio at the crocodile farm, this young chimp is taken off his chain long enough for a diaper change. And in the background is Kai Kem, an old tiger suffering from a tooth abscess. When Natasha checked with her fixers months after her reporting, they went back to see how Kai Kem was doing. He was still chained by his neck to a hook in the floor, sitting in this dark corner. And Natasha was told that when he hears people coming, he twists on his chain and turns his back to them, like he just wants to be swallowed by the wall. In the course of reporting this story, it became abundantly clear that most tourists have little idea what is happening behind the scenes. They take their photos, they ride an elephant, they pet that tiger, and they take a selfie with a sloth and move on. But that elephant has been broken, taught to fear the bull hook, while the tiger cubs have been sped bred and taken from their mother just days after birth. And most sloths are taken illegally from the forest and die within weeks of being put into captivity. So what are the ethical guidelines to engaging in wildlife tourism? Watching them from a safe distance in the wild with no interaction is ideal. But if you're going to visit facilities with captive animals, there are standards known as the five freedoms that should be followed. First, freedom from hunger and thirst. Freedom from discomfort. Do they have an appropriate environment, shelter, enough space, a place to be away from people. Freedom from pain, injury, or disease. Avoid facilities where animals are visibly injured or forced to participate in activities that could cause them harm. Freedom to express normal behavior. Being chained, performing and interacting with tourists, this is not normal for wild animals, even those born in captivity. The anteater in this photograph died shortly after the image was made. Freedom from fear and distress. Fear-based training, separation of babies from mothers, large crowds can all cause distress. Now in the midst of this story, we learned that our digital reporting had sparked concern among Peruvian wildlife officials. They raided the town of Puerta Algeria, where this photograph was made, and rescued 22 animals, including a manatee. They were all transported to rehabilitation facilities. Authorities are now working with that village to find alternate ways to generate income. It was too late for the anteater, but we heard at the very last that this town is still wildlife free. In Russia, we found traveling dolphinariums. Um, these are uh, these animals are trucked from town to town. They're packed into shallow tubs of water. And what few people in the audience would ever know is that most of these animals are illegally obtained and most die soon after being put into captivity. 